not sure. I don't. Re I don't remember quite when it was when my parents made the, the suggestion that there are always three criterion that it's good to test when you question whether you should say something or not. First of all, is it kind to say it? Is it true? It might be kind and true, but is it necessary? And I thought, oh, that's helpful. I have watched them. I've sat here and looked out in my, in my front pasture, and I see these two little people sitting with their folding chairs, just quietly, they, I don't even know they're out there, sitting by my great big black walnut trees, just sitting there in the afternoon sun, sketching. I've always wished that I could see the wee folk in the woods, but maybe I have. <laughs> maybe, maybe they're what that's all about. I'm, I'm a, I have strong type A personality tendencies. I can get fairly super rational and fairly high energy. And whenever I'm around Mary Lou and Ernie, it takes about five minutes and it's like I start to wind down. There's special places in the world, like, like I've been to Machu Picchu, and you go there and you can just tell, this is a place that exudes spirit. Well, Mary Lou and Ernie are the equivalent in terms of people. In heavenly love abiding, no change my heart shall fear. Well, your mother had sort of promised you to the Lord. Well, yes. I remember my, that? My birth, I guess, was very, very difficult. I was a breech baby. And she remembered the story of Hannah in the Bible, who had promised her son to the Lord. And so, mother, I guess, promised this child to the Lord if she could get through the experience. I seem to remember, uh, I was fairly young, that I thought the, the, the Christian thing was a very inspirational, but I, I was not a churchy kind of person. But what I really got from Jesus was that it's the way you are to one-on-one -on -one that is the bottom line. My hope I cannot measure my path to life is free. My Savior has my treasure, and He will walk with me. Probably yeah, I think they were a little younger when, than we were when we got married. Yeah, yeah there's their gift. This one. There's Ernie, with his little stockings and his little sweet cap and his smile. <laughs> Mr. Schmidt, the man teacher that taught in our one-room country grade school there in Kansas, was very, very concerned, a very kind person. He had two sisters that were missionaries, and so there was always that kind of emphasis of being of service and uh, I, I remember that was a very was a strong influence for me of course we got that at home too well this same uh, mr schmidt uh, by the time i was finished with high school and uh, then it was the draft time he helped all the boys in the community fill out uh, papers for conscientious objectors i remember going over to talk to him and he had all the forms and and had suggestions as to to how to answer the questions how nervous you were when you went on that bus well we had to uh, have a physical in uh, Leavenworth I think it was or Larned, I don't know. so we uh, took this uh, train um, McClure I've forgotten his first name was Went to high school with us, but he wasn't a Mennonite. So he was talking to all the other 
guy isn't saying, oh, these are COs, you know, he's calling attention to us. <laughs> we were a little bit trepidated, but nothing happened. In the morning, the train pulled up to a big uh, water tower and just stopped. And everybody got off. And we walked a couple of blocks into town uh, for breakfast. Well, I had never been to a restaurant. So I just uh, noticed how other people were ordering. And so I said, I'll take the same thing. And <laughs> oh, it, it, it tasted great. Yeah. <laughs> but in civilian public service, one met just all sorts of people from all over. There were Jehovah's Witnesses, and there were Methodists, and Quakers, and... Uh, that's where I learned to appreciate classical music. I really hadn't been introduced to that before. Played a lot of ping pong. I don't know if it was at this point or not. But that's mm. typical, too. Your mom was really enjoyed it more than your dad, I think. That's my middle sister, Carol. She's a professor. And that's my youngest sister, Suzanne Marty. She was Mar Martha Sue. My mom, and that's me. North Newton, Kansas. My growing up years were very affected by the war. I was in junior high when the atomic bomb was dropped. It was very sad, and we were conscientious objectors, Mennonites, and so the young men were in, in camps, they weren't in the army. So I, I really grew up feeling like this remnant, not, not mainstream at all. And I was very proud of my parents because they were really activists in that sense. And one thing with my mother uh, at the PTA in our grade school, she went to PTA and they were talking about having a, a dinner for this school and the potluck. But she noticed that the black families were not being called. So she said something about this. Well, we won't call them. They can come, but we don't want to eat their food. Well, my mother said, well, I'm not going to participate in this event. I'm resigning if, if we don't include the black families in the same way that we are everybody else. And I was very proud of that. <laughs> I mean, those are the kind of things that you really remember. And, and in those days, that was a big deal. We also had experience within the Mennonites of the real conservative type Mennonites who, who uh, we had more progressive ideas so that when, when we were, when our family would be playing uh, cards or something like that, some of the folks would not think that was good. So if somebody had come to the door, he'd, we'd have to put the cards away in case it was somebody like that. I suppose if our family had happened in on you when you were playing cards, we would have been been offended or <laughs> Yes, you probably your I don't family know, my would parents might have been. Would have been one know. of those. I don't know. I I guess I want to. <laughs> oh, that's true. That's true. Reading a letter about my parents. Very poignant. I'm teary eyed. The miracle lies in the zest. Mm -hmm. with which these two remarkable people greet each new day. It's really true. Yep. The first year you weren't there, were you? I went to another Mennonite college in Ohio yeah. when I, in my sophomore year. And then we were juniors then together when she came back. So the first year we were really in college together, we were both juniors. Yes. I and we and we had a cup. we had that walk. Mm -hmm. We had this walk where we were talking about how different we were. And I, I think we were both enjoying each other tremendously. My tongue was loosened. I could just uh, say anything I felt like saying. And <laughs> you apparently <clears throat> enjoyed it too. And yet, I had this boyfriend in Chicago I was saving myself for. That summer I spent in East Harlem in a World Council of Churches work camp. <laughs> there were two girls there that, from Bluffton College, where Mary Lou had been to school. And while we were there, I remember 
Joanna saying uh, Mary Lou had confided to her that she really kind of liked Ernie. And uh, so she was just putting a bug in my ear. <laughs> well, what happened when you found out that you got the news? Well, I remember that, too. I, Bill Gehring, who was always checking into things, he said, have you heard? Mary Lou's broken up with her steady. Wow, I perked up my ears, and I, I tried to get right in there. and was really excited. <laughs> We had sort of a wintertime courtship. By the time spring came, or s summer, then we got married. So it was just nine months of hanging out. And, and a thing that, that was so wonderful for me was that Ernie did not have a car. So we, Ernie just had these wonderful ideas for getting together, like, why don't we get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and I'll meet you you know, b like before dawn, it was still dark in the winter. And then we'll go for a walk north of the campus and watch the sun rise. Now, what could be more romantic than that? With someone like you, a pal good and true, I'd like... The way Ernie proposed to me always felt, like, what would what, I say? You know mm -hmm. what I mean about yeah. it. where it was. It was there. We were studying. Well, it, it seemed to be the proper thing for me to to say something, and I'd been thinking about it for a while. So I said something like, "How would it be if we would uh, spend the rest of our lives together?" She thought it was a good idea. Yeah. We'll build a sweet little nest somewhere out in the west. And let the rest of the world go by. Well, then we really didn't have the foggiest feeling about what we were going to do with our lives. School teaching, of course, with the degrees that we had would be the logical thing. I had a lot of trepidations about being organized enough to be a teacher. And school was, was hard in s some ways for me. And I, there was never enough art for me. It was always too many books. <laughs> so that's why I, did, I just felt like I wasn't academic enough. And Ernie, the same way, you, you just didn't have an, a, a very clear picture of, of what you wanted to do. Well, you know, what were we going to do? We were just going to stumble along, I guess. And Mm -hmm. That's really what was stumbling done. along together. Ernie rigged up this thing with the bungee cord so it doesn't fall on the ground. It was late in the season, and we found this this uh, great school in western Kansas, Arnold, Kansas, and uh, so we settled for that. This place had such a dickens of a time getting teachers to come way out there, and they didn't have any kind of decent housing. But there was a little shack that hadn't been lived in for quite a few years and had no plumbing at all. But that's our style, you know. Wow, let's start from the bottom up, you know, and this is always going to be a good story someday. We can say well, how. No, that's not why we did it. <laughs> this was going to be a good story. <laughs> I've never lived my life that way. <laughs> Had you had non-running uh, non water ever in your life? Oh, sure, on the farm. Okay, well, see, we were starting out sort of the way you had. Yeah. But I was a city girl. We had to go outside to a pump right. outside and pump out of the well. And it was, the rent was $15 a month. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but we had an oil heater. And in the winter, we paid more than that for... For the oil. For the oil. To keep warm. We did have really arguments on Saturdays. We sure I, did, yeah. We just had, Saturday was just argument day and just sort of, yeah, but not Sundays. Sundays, we went to church there a little, it was a community church, all the Protestants. We organized a little church choir and we taught Sunday school. And, uh, in the afternoon, we'd Every afternoon. take our old 38 Chevy, and uh, we'd drive out uh, 
towards the Smoky Hill River and turn on the, listen to the New York Philharmonic. The New York Philharmonic, that's what we did on Sunday afternoons. Marvelous, absolute quality time. And we never argued on Sundays. After the two years in, in Arnold, we, we really uh, weren't planning to stay definitely more than two years, so we left. And then we got this job in Nebraska. We had friends there in, in Nebraska. That's in right. In college. That encouraged us to encouraged us to come. To come. And it was a Mennonite community. There were like three Mennonite churches. We had a lot of of heart connections in Henderson. I don't know. In general, it feels like a painful experience for me because I didn't really know myself that well. I was supposed to teach so many different things. And well, the uh, a woman who had <coughs> been uh, in charge of the library left. And so uh, they asked me to be in charge of the library. So I went to, we went to, um, uh, Wichita U, which was close to home, for, uh, and I took a library course, or a couple of courses, and uh, that summer, the, the woman who was teaching these classes said, well, you know, uh, the library field is, is really good for young men, especially administration. So we ended up in library school in uh, Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. And, uh, well, but just before we left Henderson, though, little David was born. That's right. My uncle, uh, my dad's brother, was a doctor, and he had this uh, woman who was pregnant who told him that she wanted to give her baby up. Single mother, and her parents had also counseled her to let the child be adopted. So that seemed good because it, the whole family was agreeing with this. And we've just now, when he was 44 years old, he decided to find his mother. But Sue did tell us that she had held him briefly after birth Stop. and said goodbye and that it was hard for her to let him go and she told me this over the phone she's from florida and we both cried anyway so anyway then we were we had a child and uh, and that was sure joyous for me because i sure was ready to be a mom and I was also, I would, probably wouldn't go back teaching. I decided it was just going to be pursuing art for me. There's a certain life in this dough because it has yeast, and the, the yeast is a, something that's alive. But yeah, a, after David's uh, adoption then, uh, see, he was three years old. And uh, then I missed a couple of periods. But I had no expectation of getting pregnant because we had been told I had closed fallopian tubes. Ernie had not enough sperm. But I got pregnant anyway, so we actually had an Anya. And uh, it was lovely, a little girl. Then we headed for Manhattan, Kansas. I was a junior reference librarian there. So that was that was good. I had more relaxed. Uh, just wonderful people there. Just wonderful staff. Uh, but the the difficult experience came then. They had a new director, and uh, after a year, he was offered the job that he had hoped for the previous year, and so I was asked to be acting director. Well, that wasn't my cup of tea. It's not my caliber at all. But I, for some reason, couldn't say no. But, you know, I guess the universe has plans, and so here I, I took it. And about that time, uh, Jean Dost, a friend, called mm -hmm. and, and told you about uh, uh, there were some babies that uh, needed to be adopted. Mm -hmm. He was 10 weeks old when uh, we drove to Wichita and uh, took this little 10-week-old infant home. About 
a week later, was it? Mm -hmm. We were to have our um, tenth college class reunion back in, in Newton. So we headed out. We were a little bit late, I think. And uh, I was uh, keeping it right at 60 miles an hour. And coming over a rise, saw a truck had turned into an intersection, backed up and was facing in the same direction we were going. Started moving ahead slowly when we caught up and I figured, well, I can just whip around him. I, but lo and behold, when we pulled up alongside, he, he turned into us and hooked the front right uh, uh, part of our car. And I remember feeling that I was able to, trying to steer out of the skid. But next thing I knew, I was, uh, I heard David calling, Daddy, Daddy. And the car had made a complete revolution and come back down on, on its wheels. And uh, I was lying with my head right next to the, one of the front wheels. Mary Lou had a, really a cut in her foot, and, but none of the children were hurt. So yeah, we, we, stayed, we stayed in Newton with where our parents lived, and he was in the hospital for several months. So that was a real... Uh, Turning point. Wake up call. Wake up call. Yeah. So we decided we needed to move more in the direction of artwork. Yeah, I still remember we, okay, we decided, well, I think we'll go for it. We'll jump out and we'll resign. And we both remember the walk to the mailbox when I mailed that letter. Of resignation to the K-State Library. Yeah. And we moved to Berkeley in 65. And then we went, both of us went to the College of Arts and Crafts in Oakland. I took a drawing course, and Mary Lou took a philosophy of art. It was a class of graduate students. It was a graduate class. Well, I was a housewife from Kansas with no art school. And I can remember uh, the class was so full of art lingo that I wasn't familiar with at all. But I got an A, which I was very proud of, because the, uh, the teacher said that I was really bringing sort of the real world <laughs> into the scene. <laughs> so it sort of g gave, set me at, uh, on, a, on a road of being an artist. And uh, I think I was... Uh I don't know, I'd go out to Tilden Park and I'd uh, do drawings there. And then I gradually began to drive out to the coast to Point Reyes National Seashore. Uh, I had felt so much uh, more free, f uh, free psychological Psychic. space that I did a lot of paintings. I'd turn out two or three a week, I mm -hmm. think. So then we, there were art festivals We'd frame and work uh, 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 pretty hard during the summer, and then by the fall when these festivals came, we'd go over across the bay to uh, Old, Old Mill, Mill Park. Park. Old Mill Park, among the redwoods, the giant redwoods, there was an art festival. It was a three-day, so, so Friday mornings yeah. was when the people, the serious buyers, would show up on Friday mornings, and, and we would, our, our very best stuff would be sold. Well, we, we began to have sort of, well, people who knew us, you know, more and more. And so they began to um, come over to our house to, uh, at different times and wanted to buy some things. And we were used to having the doorbell ring and we were eating to family and there was somebody to buy something. This is my song, O God of all the nations, a song of peace for lands afar and mine. We, soon after we got there was the first big march with the Blue Meanies stopping us all at the border of Oakland and Berkeley. 
with their guns, bayonets out there, and so they wouldn't let us march at all in Oakland. We could march to the edge. And I was walking on this huge crowd of people, and alongside of me was this man with a couple of girls, and I got to visiting with him. Well, he was an insurance agent. And I just never forget how good that made me feel. All the kinds of people that were in that march. And people that I thought were more mainstream. I think you and David went up to the campus to hear Martin Luther King talk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and David said, uh, I want to shake his hand. So we made our way up there to the podium, you know, where after his speech people were crowding around, but we just, I made sure we got up there and we, we got up to Martin Luther King and he shook David's hand and said, good luck, we, we all need to work together or something like that. <laughs> A song of peace for their land and for mine. When we had the National Guard that just drove into Berkeley and, and just sort of took over the city, if three people would stand uh, on the street outside and talking at all, they would break us up and the, the soldiers would come and move on, move on. You can't stand here. And, uh, right at the end of our block, there was a couple of soldiers down there, right between our house and the school. So I just baked cookies. I just baked cookies and I took some cookies over to them. Now, when we uh, gave our telephone number so the soldiers uh, could call, you know. And More for, Resisters League. Yeah. We gave them our phone number if they're soldiers that need, need a place to come. We had uh, four or five uh, soldiers that we housed in our home hiding from the Army, AWL, because most of them were shipped off to Vietnam from Oakland. So we, we had at least four or five of those young men. I don't know if we had hardly any neighbors who weren't against the war in Vietnam. And so the, fi the final soldier that we kept, James, ended up simply moving around our neighborhood from house to house for about a year. Yes, he was, he was a very, very special person. But James eventually turned himself in to the Presidio in San, in, uh, San Francisco there. I guess he called us occasionally. Well, he was put in jail, in yeah. prison. We were concerned that if he called us, that then we would be too obvious, because we were participating in unlawful acts, hiding AWO. That would be a federal offense. So we had a neighbor a block away who was willing to have their telephone number be the one that James would call. So it felt really like we were in a state of siege, you know, or we had, we had to hide to that degree. Or, and it doesn't feel like that, it's that different happening now. It's just coming down now. And then 70, was it 70 or 71 that we then moved to the mission? To the mission. Through the Berkeley Friends meeting, we had uh, met a couple of young couples. Well then, after sort of getting to know them, an opportunity came up through another person that we knew, a Pearl, uh, who was living down in the San Antonio Mission area as a third order Franciscan. I think she talked to, the, to Father Allen or somebody about that there were some couples. He was interested in this because what was happening at the mission was that the old fathers there were sort of pro-military and they were very cozy with the army, and it was in the middle of a military reservation, and Father Allen was a pacifist Franciscan priest. And so when Pearl suggested there were some families in Berkeley that were pacifists and were artists, and maybe could come and live at the mission. And so he, he sort of decided, well, if I put some young families in there that are pacifists, uh, they could sort of liven things up. Well, maybe, maybe they could support themselves. Uh, yes, if yeah. they were involved with arts and crafts and through the gift shop, right? So he called us. We had a meeting with him in, in Oakland, and he said, uh, 
that he would like it if we would just move there and we could sell our art out of the gift shop and that would be our money. But when the word got out around the, the Hunter Liggett military reservation and the little towns, it was this Berkeley bunch is going to come up, hippies, nudists, whatever. They were very up in arms. So they complained to the bishop. So Father Allen called us and said, you need to go and talk to the bishop. <laughs> and it was so interesting. He, he was so nervous, he couldn't even let us into his office to visit. He brought chairs out from his inner office to the waiting room. There was, we were getting nowhere, just nowhere. But Somehow we got to, uh, I guess he talked to us who we were and what we were, and we had brought our, our book of photographs of our, art. of our art. So he was sort of leafing through that, and he came to this, my portrait of my grandmother. It looked like his grandmother. That's right. He, he said, did you paint this? This looks like my grandmother. And then you said, well, it's my grandmother, and we grew up, where are you from? Kansas. Oh, well, I grew up in Kansas. <laughs> and you could see him relax. He relaxed, and then he said, oh, I think I know who you folks are. You're holy hermits. Yeah. <laughs> he found a pigeonhole, and now he could be comfortable. We were there for 12 months. It was a dramatic place to live. Those corridors and uh, people would play shams and Renaissance music and, and the Catholic celebrations. And then our pacifism was really, uh, it was on stage because we had these soldiers who would come down, who are you and what is, what are your beliefs? And it was the Vietnam War, and this one... Some of them would come at night. They weren't supposed to come during away. the day. Mm -hmm. They told her we were sort of off limits. They knew they couldn't keep them from coming, but they didn't want it to look like there was a lot of army getting brainwashed by the pacifists. <laughs> Somehow uh, there was a corporal and a sergeant, and they began on off hours, they began to help us and, and uh, work in the Rose Garden. Well, eventually, I guess, Colonel Morley found out about them, and so he wanted them to spy on us and find out uh, what was really going on. And, and I guess uh, Westmoreland was even a little bit concerned, thinking we were stashing uh, weapons or something. We were guerrillas, actually. Yeah. So. And, well, actually, when the soldiers found out about the, with these two, they just laughed so hard because they saw the ridiculousness of the paranoia. And who was the Pentagon guy that was there? Yes. He was, fig he was figuring out new weapons. and He was one of the psychologists for the Pentagon who was working on all kinds of psychological warfare. Well, he came and met us, and his daughter was a born pacifist. And he recognized that in her, that she felt totally at home with us. And he told us, well, the, if the, all the world was like you, it would be a better place. But it isn't, so I have to, you know, keep the power trip going. Well, then there was Martha Lees, who was the wife of... Uh, Lieutenant Colonel. Yeah. We had potlucks there, and uh, we had our big circle, and... and and she loved to come to those potlucks. So she brought General Oaks from, from uh, Fort Ord. We and all joined hands before the meal. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards she wanted you to sing uh, the George Fox song. Mm -hmm. For the general. Especially the verse, If we give you a pistol, will you fight for the Lord? Oh, you can't kill the devil with a gun or a sword. Will you swear on the Bible, I will not, said he, for the truth is more holy than the book to me. Walk in the light wherever you may be, walk in the light wherever you may be. In my old leather breeches and my shaggy, shaggy locks, I am walking in the glory of the light, said Fox.
there were a lot of, of uh, amazing lessons and experiences that I think we felt were extremely valuable for us and for our family, and I think we felt it was a very th good thing to do. But it turned out that one year was definitely long enough because I felt that I had to make a choice between my nuclear family, my small little, with my three children, and the larger community. And I felt like bottom line was it was our smaller unit. So that's why it, it was a very full uh, year. But after that, uh, we just decided that we needed to go back home to Berkeley. Then it seemed very peaceful, quiet, and simple. When we had left Berkeley, it, Berkeley seemed kind of busy and complicated, but it, it seemed a lot simpler compared to the community we lived in at the, at the mission. So that was 71. 75 is when we moved yeah. here then. So we had another four or five years in Berkeley. And I think we were beginning to feel that maybe the Well, I think what happened about that time was that uh, David was hanging out on Telegraph Avenue and, and, you know, getting into drugs and stuff. And, and then Jonathan was, what, 14? And um, he went on a tour with other teenagers his age. They landed up in Argentina, Canada, and then at the end of the summer, Jonathan said, you know, I just feel better about myself when I'm out in the country. And David, too, uh, felt he was Get wanting to city. move to the country. Get out of the city. So that was the incentive. We've always had a connection where we've moved. We had heard uh, Caroline from Alpha speak at Friends Yearly Meeting and talking about their intentional community. And so we thought, uh, yeah, that would be, they'd be good people to know and be neighbors. That was another Quaker connection. And so we came up here seriously to buy a place. People told us, well, there's that old schoolhouse for sale. And just as we walked up to the door over there, a real estate agent walked up at the same time. And uh, he thought he might trade this one for another one, but we just made him an offer right away. So we bought the place, just like that. When we first got here, it was uh, actually about Christmas time in 75, and people from the uh, community came around and, and did some caroling, didn't they? Yeah, that, that was a great beginning to have people coming around caroling for us. So we've been doing it ever since. We haven't stopped. <laughs> Mary Lou and Ernie, they're very, very, very playful people. You can see that a lot when their kids are around. When uh, our daughter Alexandra was very small, Ernie built this little swing for her that hangs um, from a little beam in the bedroom. Their whole house is just incredibly kid-friendly. When Collins, our grandson, was in kindergarten, uh, we went to uh, visit his class. And, and during recess time, the kids all rushed out to this little platform where they could grab hold of this rope and ride down on a pulley down to the ground. So I got aircraft cable, and but it took some doing to do this because this end where you get on, it was too high and it was much too fast. And uh, Mary Lou was a guinea pig, is that the, would be the term, I wish she was the one who was trying it. So we finally got it adjusted the other end so that it was just about right so that you'd land on the ground. So. And we've worn out, uh, I don't know, three sets of pulleys, I guess. And it would be quite a roster if we'd had everybody's sign who <laughs> was written on that. Yeah. Well, when we first came, um, we had this problem, I don't know, is it a problem, to become established. But it took a little while to, uh, for people to catch on to 
what we were offering at Saturday Market. Yeah, we would sell at the art shows at Berkeley in Mill Valley. We sold everything in, in our booth. We didn't have anything left at the end. The first three times that I went to Saturday Market, I didn't sell anything. And that's how, literally, we paid for the groceries. So we had to be pretty frugal with our cash. Every week we had potlucks <laughs> here at our house. And the phone rang, and I went over there, and this this man from New York calling and said, I've seen your work advertised in the New York Botanical Garden catalog, these cards. I, I really like the way you do flowers, and I think they, would, they might look very good on China, and I wonder if you'd be interested in designing for our company. So I just said, well, I, I'm glad that you like my work, but I said, I'm not a commercial artist. I don't think I could help you out. Well, he said, I want to come talk to you about it. How do I get to Deadwood, Oregon? And, of course, you know me. I like company, and I like all kinds of things like that, so I didn't hesitate with that. Sure, come and see us, and I'll look forward to it, but I'm not promising anything. And just before he hung up, I said, I just want to say a couple other things. I don't really work well working for big companies where things are impersonal. I need really very personal connections in order to do artwork. So I, I think he kind of laughed and said, well, I own the company, and I'm planning to come and see you in Deadwood. And that seems pretty personal. I agreed with him. That's personal. Okay. <laughs> so I don't know. It was less, it was not more than a week or 10 days, and he was here. And he wanted to see my portfolios of drawings. And the first batch that I had was Trillium. And he said, I think uh, this would make a beautiful china pattern. And when he explained to me that he just wanted to take the drawings the way I did them and then put them on china, uh, he wasn't asking me to make china designs. And I said, I haven't ever seen it. No, he said, I don't think there's ever been china like this. We're doing something new. We're doing something new. When I have a show, I also like to show this because this describes the decal and what they do at the fair. When I knew that I was going to be appearing in many places and at the, at the opening at Block China, I, I made a book for that. But then I took that book with me on all the trips that we made all over the United States and shared them in department stores. But it was a book that showed our home here and our family our children, our grandson, and my dad dying of uh, multiple sclerosis. We built him a coffin. Yeah, a wooden coffin. And the quilts that we made in Deadwood and one of them that we sent to the Soviet Union. And then when I became a grandmother, I had this uh, a birthday party and I invited everybody in Deadwood that wanted to come and we had a tea party in the woods with the elves. And I had pictures in the book with, I said everybody should wear a hat of some sort because the elves were much more comfortable with these big giants if they at least had hats on. But here were these little people just wide-eyed and these kids were just, <laughs> they were just seeing it, I think. So uh, that, that really did uh, make a meaningful trip all over the United States. People who took the time to sit there with me would look through that book and all the subject matter that we could cover in, a, in the lifestyle. And, and then I had my dulcimer, so I would sing. It, it wasn't something I wanted to keep doing over and over was discussing the china. I could leave that up to the salespeople in the store. That was their business and their job. But to be able to just be there and just be a person and connect in a personal heart way with people in the midst of this Madison Avenue bye 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 energy. I, I coped with that because I, I don't really go to department stores for my own needs. But here I was ironically or paradoxically appearing in all these places which I never would go. But I, I brought my own world to them and I could share my world in the midst of that world. Well I remember in, in Omaha uh, here was a lady that you got to talking to, and uh, you had this quilt, was it the hearts? 
Well, she was from Hawaii, and her husband was there on a business trip, and she got very bored on these business trips. Then she saw me working on this quilting on this quilt that had hearts, and she looked at that. She said, oh, I could do something like that. I've always wanted to make a quilt, but it just looked too complicated. Now I know why I came on this trip with my husband, you know, just so I could see you working on this simple quilt here, and she could hardly wait to get home and get going with making a quilt, <laughs> a simple quilt with hearts. I don't remember whether, um, how many times we went to the Marshall Fields um, State Street store. At least twice. Store, yeah, I think we went twice. Or which of the occasions this was, but I think it was when your um, poinsettia had a huge display there. Christmas in Chicago, and all the loop was all lit up with little lights, and, and um, snow was falling softly. It was just a, a really uh, picturesque time. And we, had, we were also going to appear in the water tower store, and we had several hours. And it was in the east. So we asked if we could just walk instead of getting transportation. When we got near the water tower store, we heard singing. And we got closer, and there were three black men, beautiful voices, singing in gorgeous harmony Christmas carols. And so we stopped. And when, when they quit, we paused and we said, Maybe you could come up and sing with us inside the store. Oh, how? How can we do that? We didn't get, I said, well, I'm appearing there in the China department on the third floor. And why don't you just come on up and you can sing with us up there in the China because you, you guys really have wonderful. So we went on up and when I got up to the third floor, I told what I had done. Oh, Mary Lou, he said, you didn't have any permission to invite people on the street up here. But very soon after that, here come these three guys up the escalator. And we just got busy right away and sang um, Silent Night, Silent Night and, uh, and Jingle Bells. Mm -hmm. And people stopped. More and more people uh, joined us. and uh, We had a big crowd yeah. hanging out right at the bottom of the escalator. So as people came down the escalator, they were hearing it and seeing us sing. Everybody was singing Christmas carols, leading them in Christmas carols. But the Silent Night that we sang, in my whole entire life, I have never sung Silent Night the way it felt then, with these three young men who could harmonize. It was very beautiful. Mary Lou and Ernie are the institutional memories of the Deadwood Valley. And when somebody comes into the valley, they are one of the first people to get them acquainted and get them uh, settled in. And I think that's very valuable for all of us. And the networking, my gosh, the networking they do, how they pull people in together, you know, they are such peacemakers. I guess Mary Lou and Ernie, too, for me, are community glue. They were always, always there to be supportive, and I know they've done that for scores and scores of people. My wife became ill, and uh, in, a, in a rather serious way, and uh, Mary Lou and Ernie were very supportive of that, and uh, visited us uh, often. As a matter of fact, that picture up there is a copy of a painting that Mary Lou and Ernie I don't remember which one made it, of some flowers that June had uh, up here uh, on one of their visits. And I, I, that's one of my treasures. They're just Midwestern practicality, um, frugality, living simply, which many of us try to do, but it's really tough. Where we've both grown up in very frugal homes, I think. Maybe that's part of it. Well, I, mean, I think my particular inclinations or style was sort of to see how elegant a life you could live with how little, instead of maximizing. And it just seems more exciting and interesting to me to, 
to create beauty uh, with limited stuff rather than having too much. And now that they make their own cards, and I think they do it quite inexpensively, I mean, I've gone dumpster diving with Mary Lou uh, behind print shops so that she can get little pieces of paper and scraps that they've thrown away, <laughs> and she turns them into art. Uh, if you can keep from creating complexity, it somehow works out better. But it's not always possible. There are dilemmas that there aren't really that many answers for. I don't certainly don't have answers for all of the dilemmas we find ourselves in. I just hope all of these things we're saying are, <laughs> are true. I, I'm skeptical, you know, when I... The opposite is also true, you know, <laughs> of a lot of these things. <laughs> Well, it's possible when you have this idea of trying to be simple that you get just that in itself makes it complicated. I mean, you know, there are times when, when you can create just the opposite thing that you're trying to do. <laughs> and, and the other side of it is that everydayness is what we mostly live with, ordinary everydayness. And uh, when I was this big Cinderella going around the country with the black china and designing and with, with all these fancy people and everything. I always thought, well, that's, it's, it's pretty nice, but it's going to end. And in fact, people would say to me, oh, how does it feel? And I'd, I'd say, well, I'm going to die. <laughs> Keep the perspective. And I, and I think the three words for me especially are, uh, oh goodness, I can't think of the first one now. Ambiguity. Ambiguity, ambiguity. There is a tremendous amount of ambiguity. Mystery, absolute mystery and paradox. And the rest, the joy and the fun and everything is just bonus. <laughs> Total bonus. And have as much of that bonus as you can get but be willing to, to accept the ambiguity, the mystery, and the paradox. Tis a gift to be simple, tis a gift to be free, tis a gift to come down where we are to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, we will be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend we will not be ashamed. To turn, turn, will be our delight, till by turning and turning we come round, round.